right, I think we should go ahead and get started. I'm Cliff Lynch. I'm the director of the Coalition for Networked Information. And uh, I welcome you to the fourth and uh, final day of week two of the CNI uh, Fall 2020 virtual member meeting. Uh, week two, just to remind you, is themed around organizational and professional change and transformation. Uh, I note that along with the, um, the presentations that we have been seeing, the project briefings from the last few days and the ones that we'll have today, there are also some pre-recorded videos that we've made available as part of this week's um, uh, presentations. And I'd invite you to uh, enjoy those as well. We will be doing a summing up uh, session at four o'clock on, uh, on next Monday, um, trying to synthesize some of the main themes we've been hearing out of these presentations. A few mechanical things. The session is being recorded and it will be made publicly available later. Uh, there is closed captioning available. Please make use of that if it's helpful. There is a chat box. Um, please feel free to use that to introduce yourself, share information with other attendees, um, or make comments as the presentation goes. There's also a Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. And um, please feel free to pose questions as they occur to you during the presentation. We will actually try and address all the questions at the end after we've heard from both of our speakers in a um, question and answer uh, session that will be chaired by Diane Goldenberghardt of CNI. And I think that's all the logistical stuff I wanna do. So let me introduce um, the session and our speakers. Uh, we have two speakers with us today, Lori Taylor and Todd Digby. Uh, both are from the University of Florida. And the session is, at least as I understand it from the abstract, obviously we're all gonna see the session. It's a little hard to describe, it really, it really to me is about sort of cultural and organizational change um, as well as how that plays out through technological work and technological practices. And it also has an element to me of taking sort of broad ideas um, uh, very much in the spirit of the, um, the generous thinking that Kathleen Fitzpatrick proposed to us in a recent plenary session um, and actually moving them into the sort of day-to-day -day practices and culture of an organization. And uh, I hope that that's more or less um, a good frame for this. If it's not, I'll I look forward to learning why. And with that, I'll just thank Todd and Lori for joining us and hand it over to Lori. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and thanks so much for having us here today. Um, good afternoon and welcome to everyone. I'm Lori Taylor and I'm here with Todd Digby. And today we're speaking about compassionate computing, leveraging socio-technical practices for technical and cultural change. For this presentation, we will start <clears throat> with um, by situating the perspective from the University of Florida and specifically from our new division, Library Technology and Digital Strategies. Then we'll define compassionate computing as a philosophical approach and share examples of how we practice compassionate computing. We will also share related philosophies, concepts and practices, including discussing justice, both procedural and informational and the triangle of satisfaction. We will then conclude with a take home message. Our story, like all stories, has many beginnings and trajectories. Right now, we have selected some of the core elements that have brought us to, to compassionate computing. Much of our work begins with digitization in libraries and with the problems and promise that it enabled, including forming new roles, requiring new types of ongoing maintenance and sustainability for technologies and new digital projects and formats that required robust support for project management and project portfolio management. For UF, our digital story began with extremely intense pressure for preservation and specifically began in collaboration with the Caribbean. Our Caribbean collaborations date back to the founding 
of the university because our libraries have always identified as being Caribbean libraries. When the Farmington plan started, UF stepped up for the Caribbean. The Farmington plan was the US plan for how to support access to all the world's materials by having different US institutions take responsibility for parts. UF's work ranged widely. In the 1940s to the 1970s, UF regularly had library workers on boats and planes with microfilm cameras, microfilming materials. The promise was that each partner and UF would get a copy of the materials for preservation and access. Fast forward to the 1990s when UF started working in experimental digitization. Of course, the greatest need and impact are from Caribbean materials, often only held at UF with so many materials lost to storms and other and tropical climate. By 1999, UF's experiments had grown to the founding of the Digital Library Center which formalized digital work. The work is complex and connects across many people within digital units and beyond. So additional supports for collaboration come into play. Also, UF continued to work on Caribbean materials. Thanks to the leadership from the University of the Virgin Islands, the Digital Library of the Caribbean, or DLOC, comes into being. Its goal was to support preservation and access as done by and for the Caribbean. The robust governance model and underlying principles of mutual aid and ethics of care continued to drive DLOC forward and continued to spread ideas and ways of working across all partners, including from folks at UF. In the 2000s, we saw exciting new work that built upon digitization for, for what comes next. This included digital humanities, digital scholarship, radical collaboration, our official goal with research computing, um, it was radical collaboration, team science, and more. All of this rich and wonderful work presents a lot of new needs. The libraries created the Digital Partnerships and Strategies Department to support the complexities of partnership building and technical and cultural change. As part of our work in enabling equity throughout through process, technological and cultural changes, in January 2020, the libraries at UF updated the organizational structure to bring together two departments, library technology services and digital library or digital partnerships and strategies into a new division, library technology and digital strategies. The libraries established the new division because of the importance and pervasiveness of technology. The two departments had, have interconnected work and the organizational change enabled increased effectiveness through change ways, changed ways of working one of the most important changes has been the focus on what we have termed compassionate computing. We started to use the term compassionate computing to bring together known best practices, including from generous thinking, um, thank you, uh, Kathleen Fitzpatrick, um, and also from collaborative partnerships and technologies. These best practices include recognizing that all technologies are socio-technical and thus include policies, practices, people, and communities who are using the technologies. That for optimal work, we must consider how technologies will be used and maintained. And that comple confronting complexity requires compassion and grace. We need established rules, practices, and patterns to ensure consistent and equitable operations. Just as well, we must be able to radically change if needed. We know how we can do this, especially with UF by drawing on our experience as Floridians and as Caribbean community members and how we respond to hurricanes collectively. That by focusing our, on technical optimization and compassion, we can best support everyone, including our technology workers. And by structuring our work as compassionate computing, we can best support our current needs and our future planning. Further, we envision compassionate computing in relation to responsiveness overall, including enabling resilient and resistant operations. When the pandemic required major and urgent changes, we used the concept of compassionate computing to focus our community to be able to rapidly pivot and develop new methods. So on this slide, um, we're sharing some of our shared values for our work, um, and the link goes to the, the full shared values document. As part of creating the new division, we had strategic planning retreat sessions over the summer when we were all fully remote. Um, and coming together, you know, we developed our shared values. I'm hoping that these values resonate with everyone um, for what folks see just the sampling on the screen. Stating values is a necessary part of collaborative work so that we can begin from places of understanding for what our perspective is and then how we also engage with others. So we loved the process of creating our shared values document. Um, and we especially love our statement on empathy, uh, which is 
We work from a place of empathy for our users, our systems, and ourselves. Part of having that shared values, it orients our situated perspective for how we engage with the world, how we engage with our collaborators. And part of that is how do we enable satisfaction? How do we have procedural justice? How do we have informational justice and in our engagement and communication with others? And we're basing this on, and we shared this in our strategic planning retreat with our teams, the triangle of satisfaction, which depicts the three types of needs that need to be addressed in any negotiation. Satisfaction is based on emotion, outcome, and process. In our work as technologists, how often do we get to have folks be fully satisfied? We have philosophies and methods like Agile and Scrum, project portfolio management, acceptance criteria, and more to support the process, the result, and the emotion. But even with these supports, how often are our stakeholders satisfied? And how about our technology workers? We hope that everyone has high levels of justice in their workplaces and high levels of satisfaction, but we know that this is a lot of work to achieve. And at UF, we're getting there. In the past, we had a major problem with our technical folks because of communication with other folks. So we needed to bridge that connection together. We needed better communication across groups who had not been productively connected in the past. To make the change, we knew we needed to build empathy and compassion to be able to support problems as they arise and to deal with them collaboratively together as equals. At UF, we've started talking about compassionate computing as a way to bring folks closer together for a huge host of needs. Some of these, our first ever web migration, we've got many web systems in use. We've never done a full completed web migration and new information architecture. So this is a huge lift for technical and cultural change. We're in the process of migrating our digital collection system. We're also in the process of implementing an archival finding aid system with archive space. And we're dealing with so many chicken and egg problems. How do we implement needed methods, practices, and patterns for stabilizing our work for future growth? when we're awash in urgent and important work. We have lots of examples here, obviously from the pandemic and remote work, but also from things from moving to, from server space to using OneDrive for our different user files, changing how we handle lib apps, rolling out programs, uh, uh, programmatic support for UF lib domains, which uses reclaim hosting. Little things that are also big things like active direct directory cleanup, upskilling workers in the tech units and more. For this host, huge host of needs, we're doing great on all of them, which is really, really wonderful, especially in 2020. And it's because we're using compassionate computing to bring our groups together across the libraries in a productive and generous manner. We're implementing compassionate computing as a way to change culture. We have our shared values and related practices. And here we have some guiding questions to take the abstract to the concrete. One simple example comes from our pandemic and remote work. Prior to the pandemic, UF did not allow people to take equipment home. Then we had a workplace who needed to work from home. We had no methods and suddenly we had to do, a lar do this at scale. Following compassionate computing, we knew we had to fulfill our mission of supporting workers. That meant we had to support people in taking equipment home. We had to make it easy for them and easy for us to comply with requirements for tracking equipment. Within a day, we changed how we process equipment requests, we sent people home with equipment, we expanded help desk hours, and began home computing support. The image here is a, a, a Wi-Fi USB um, card. Normally, UF would not buy equipment if it was not seen as if it was seen as redundant. Folks each had one five-foot network cable from their from their desktop computers. Um, taking your work office workstation home caused problems. Um, you have a short network cable that people that people and their kids and dogs are tripping over with their dining, dining room now being their home offices. We knew we needed, um, people needed options like Wi-Fi cards. We brought them, uh, bought them where we could, but supplies were short and things were back ordered. Um, and we worked with fiscal units to support reimbursements when we couldn't order enough, but individuals could find them on their own. By practicing compassionate computing, we had a smooth process for these and ton of other dramatic changes that we have that we do and how we work. To implement these changes in how we support technology in an increased compassionate way, we also needed to focus on creating a staffing environment within the library technology services department that embraced these ideas and changes. This matters libraries at UF had have conducted the ARL climate call, organizational climate and diversity assessment. 
which is an assessment of library staff perceptions concerning libraries commitment to principles of diversity, organizational policy and procedures and staff attitudes. The libraries conducted this survey in 2014 and 2019. In 2014, the survey placed the library technology department well below the other departments and units across the library in many of the areas. Although the department saw significant increases in the 2019 results, there were still improvements to be made. One area that we focused on was, improve, um, was to improve departmental communication and information sharing, which resulted, as Lori mentioned, in a series of strategic planning retreat meetings that were held in a remote fashion, since we're all remote now. This activity helped foster an understanding of the various aspects of the work across the department and also led to actionable changes in how we document and communicate our work, both within the department and across the libraries. I feel that this has led to an increased sense of ownership and pride in the work that is done. We have also engaged in taking the uh, recently engaged in taking the everything disc assessment to build better understanding of what our personal and workplace tendencies are and how others may approach activities differently. I believe this is a key factor in our department's abilities to understand those that we support in partnership with so that we can keep building on our compassionate computing approach. Another way that uh, we uplifted compassion as part of compassionate computing with the pandemic and the, remove, and the move to remote work, a, a key example is the Practicing Kindness and Crisis series, which was in partnership with the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Librarian and in the Library Press at UF. The series offers multiple ways for personnel to share what makes them a whole person. So we had a, a, a web series and it also had an online book that's in press books um, where we leverage technology to bring folks together um, with the web series and the online book to share our stories as whole workers, as whole people, and to connect meaningfully with, with technology. So we've used that for sharing different recipes, um, uh, for sharing about gardening, for having difficult discussions on structural racism. How do we bring together, how do we deal with this with our world and how do we support each other when we're in the remote fashion. So looking at how we leverage technology to support compassion and support our community. One thing that was really exciting about this series, we had the first series with the first group um, and it successfully completed. Okay, this was a bridge to help everyone feel still more connected and feel more comfortable with how we use different digital technologies. Um, Zoom was new for so many folks. So how to do this in a fun um, and low consequences way, if, you're, you forget, if you forget to unmute yourself, if there are other problems, to bring people together as whole workers. Um, and so the, the first showrunner series for the Practicing Kindness felt that the work had been done. And so they closed the series. I, another group came along and said, hey, we really want to do that. We want to modify the format a little bit. But so now we have a new showrunner and a new format. And so the technologies and frame that we're already in use were enabling. And so now we're on to season two, uh, which has covered, again, cooking, always popular, um, and a special for Halloween on doing Halloween makeup. And so we'll see what comes next. Thank you all for being with us today. Um, today we've discussed how a philosophy of compassionate computing informs all aspects of our work at UF. The work is important because we're best when we work from a place of empathy. We know that working collaboratively in a structured manner allows us to build empathy for each other. Whether you adopt compassionate computing or are already following shine theory or uh, generous thinking, part of our work as technology leaders is to know that we are best when we work from places of empathy and to utilize philosophies and methods like compassionate computing to uplift empathy. And so to close, we wanted to end with just a short clip uh, of a beautiful reminder that we are always all together uh, with the short clip from In the Same Boat, Pushed by the Same Wind.
Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Todd. Uh, we really appreciate your coming to CNI to share uh, these methods and strategies with us. It's a pleasure to hear about and really interesting to think about using these kinds of strategies in our day to day work. Um, and I want to thank all of our attendees for joining us today. The floor is now open for questions. Uh, please type your questions into the Q&A box and I will be happy to moderate those. And I see that we do have a question now from Michael Seidel, who comments that this is very interesting, but he asks, how are you measuring your success in being compassionate? That is, what metrics are you using? Compassion is a lovely, but nonetheless fuzzy concept that must make measurement hard. Absolutely. Um, Todd, I don't know if you want to start on this or? Sure, I, I can start a little bit. I would say that um, I would agree. It, it, it is, it's, it's to a degree hard to measure, um, but I think part of the measurement is, is how well the rest of the library responds to you and your unit and how they're interacting with you. And so um, I think there's a long history of, um, in the past of technology workers, technology support workers being sort of like, um, they only get told when something's broken and here, fix it. And sometimes oh, you fixed it, but you didn't fix it the way I wanted it to be. Um, and so they, the, there's a mentality of saying, okay, you know, we're sort of just, we are just respond to issues. And, and through this approach, we're taking much more of a partnership approach that, you know, even the, the st staff within technology is when they fix something, they feel pride in that and they feel more of a partnered approach to it. Um, I think some of the measurements are, for instance, this last year we had, uh, or just last month, we had our annual Employee Excellence Awards uh, ceremony and um, the library department as a whole won a behind the scenes award. We had, you know, there's 40, 50 some nominations on this and there's just a handful of awards and the technology department as a whole got recognized and this is recognized by the rest of the library staff as well as the web team got another award for how they worked um, and, and, and built capacity within the web migration. So I think those are some of the things that there's not a hard metric to it, but we're seeing results. And we're seeing people not being afraid to call up the technology people and say, can you help me with this? Or I have an idea on this. What do you think about this? I think those type of interactions and coming to us more for as, as partners and potential experts in the area rather than um, sort of not wanting to deal with us unless something's broken kind of thing like that. Yeah, and just to add on to that, the award is a great example. Um, some of the um, the more hard metrics uh, we'll expect to have in the next climate call survey, um, which we'll probably do in 2024. It's a little while to wait for, you know, <laughs> for reactions and deliverables. Um, so we're continuing different discussions within uh, the units, talking about how we work with other people, how we want to work, what constitutes job satisfaction for people who work with technology. So working with technology can be pretty frustrating. Other people don't understand what the requirements are, what the difficulty levels are, and you can just end up with friction. Some of the ways that we can see that we've reduced friction, um, we actually have more, few, we have fewer open tickets than we used to. That's really great to see. Our projects are going faster than they used to. Um, we've implemented um, overall projects, um, uh, project portfolio management. So that's done at the different unit level. We have either one month or three month stakeholder check-ins. And so we have regular assessment um, with our different stakeholders for all of the different projects to chart um, activity, progress, and success. So that's also been going really well. And the general ease with which we see the department working um, and communicating with others and the confidence level. So we have a lot of sort of softer, fuzzier measures, but we also have things like fewer tickets, you know, obviously the departmental awards, um, and then the different feedback sessions, like at the Everything Disc um, session, which we had just a week ago, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, That's and I would say it, it's, it's kind of, in my mind, part of compassionate is also building clear understanding. And I think that's like Lori said, coming up with more uh, straight, uh, project plans and things like that. And part of it was actually becoming more stringent on how we document and say, when is something done? When When is your project? When do you think your project's completed? And being a bit more firm in how we document and actually have sort of, okay, no, we actually have finished this process. Because there was a tendency, at least historically, that the projects just languished because always the, uh, the goals of the project uh, always changed. As the project went on, there was like, oh, no, 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 we need to change this and this and this. So it, it felt like nothing was ever getting done. 
but by actually making things a bit more stringent and compartmentalizing the changes or the development, we're actually able to check things off and make progress. And it's that clear understanding both between, for us providing the support or development and for those um, library staff and other users that we support being happy with what we did. Yes, we completed what we both agreed needed to be completed on. Okay, now we can go to the next phase, kind of thing like that. That is really interesting. That, that, that was a great question, Michael. Thank you so much. And I'm just struck by how the common thread is communication. <laughs> that can really make all the difference in the world. And Michael says, thank you. Um, please, to our attendees, feel free to jump in with any questions you might have. We do have time here. Um, while we're waiting, if I may ask a question, I'm curious to know um, how, um, how common is this kind of a strategy in other organizations? And I think what I'm wondering about is when you have a new hire, how much onboarding or acculturation is needed typically? Do, have they seen this kind of approach before or is it all new to most people? It, so on the digital partnership side, it's very familiar. This is how we work with partnerships, a lot of humanities, um, digital humanities collaboration background. With IT, it's all over the place. You know, so many of our technology workers have gotten used to startup culture or you know, turn it and burn it. What can you turn around? Can you sleep on the floor? Um, really not, not acceptable working <laughs> conditions um, or climates. And so, and then so many of our workers you know, have come to the libraries because they want a better family environment. They want to have um, time with their family families on holidays and things, um, but then orienting them to, so this, this is how our libraries work. And we've just been onboarding several people virtually, which Todd, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, yeah, we've, we've got a digital development team who, um, back at the start of this, we had, um, we were building the team up um, right when the pandemic hit. Um, and then we had one of, one of the team leave, actually a couple of the team leave. And so we've actually, out of the team of four, um, we have three people that we've onboarded um, since the pandemic and they've never seen their offices. <sighs> totally remote fashion. Um, but, you know, and I, I think the communication is important. Um, doing onboarding, we have a really good, we have onboarding within the libraries as well for new staff and new, uh, and new staff orientation to the libraries. But one of the things that I think is important to, you know, especially with, I, I come from, I'm a, I'm a librarian is my background. so. But a lot of technology people it isn't. And so they see themselves as technology people that happen to be working in a library. And I really want to change that framework and say, no, you're a library technologist now, so that they can have that ownership of what they do. They just it just, well, I'm just programming this. It just happens to be for a library. But no, take that, you know, just, you know, it doesn't matter what level of developer or, or IT technical support person handling computers, um, getting them more into that library mindset, I think is really, it, it takes a while, but I think um, it's something you just keep working with mm -hmm. um, and onboarding. And and the communication's really good. And that communication starts right from the beginning. Um, even though we hired a developer that's two steps down, sort of, I don't directly oversee them, but the person, and even me staying in close contact as that onboarding process came on saying, just, you know, reach out for me, any questions you have, you know, things like that. And, and building those communication paths at all levels within the department is hugely, um, I think, beneficial in making them feel welcome as, as a whole to the team. That's what you said also, Todd, on people seeing themselves not as technologists and not as part of the libraries. We haven't heard that. I actually had not reflected that we haven't heard that in over six oh. months now. So we yeah. used to hear things in project planning meetings like, well, I'm not a librarian, um, you know, which, which wasn't any way bad. It was just like, that's not my domain. I'm not comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And so it was a signaling of, of distance, you know, and, okay. and other people would say, well, you're not a librarian. And it was like, okay, but we all work in libraries. We need to have shared con mm -hmm. communication, shared language, and, you know, and it doesn't have to be the same background, mm -hmm. um, you know, but we need to be able to connect together. Um, and we, so we talked to everyone like, look, we're in libraries, this is what we do. I have a PhD in English, I don't have a library science degree, but I consider myself a librarian. I'm not saying everyone has to consider that, you know, you don't have to identify that way, but we do work in libraries. So we have to identify as library workers. Mm -hmm. And in talking about that, yeah, we haven't heard that come up from mm -hmm. either side, you no. know, y'all aren't librarians or I'm not a librarian. 
that hasn't happened in over six months. That's a really cool and reflected. Yeah, yeah. really interesting. Well, that was super, super interesting. Thank you so much. I appreciate you indulging me in my question. And I see that we are just a bit past time here. So I don't want to hold you up anymore. But with a huge thanks uh, to Todd and Lori for coming to CNI and chatting with us and to our attendees, thank you so much for making time out of your day. If you'd like to hang around after I turn off the recording, please feel free to do so. You can just raise your hand, I can unmute you and uh, feel free to have a chat with our presenters or join the conversation. Um, otherwise, I hope we'll see you back at CNI uh, this afternoon or next week or in, this, in the coming days. And uh, take care everyone, bye-bye.